degrees. We're, yeah, everything has to be just right. Thank you so much, and good morning. We really, really, really appreciate the warm welcome you've given us, the words of encouragement, the gratitude you've expressed for three days has meant so much to us. I just want to ask you a favor. Stop feeding us. <laughs> look, look, look what you did. Look what you did. I mean, that's all, between the, what was it called, the Concho de Fuego Brazilian Steakhouse and then the ranch last night, I believe we've eaten the entire contents of a rodeo. One, you know, so stop it. And but I don't know what it is with you Texas people. You know, there are these things and they grow out of the ground and they're green, they're uh, vegetables, yes. Might want to look into that. So, I mean, stop feeding us. That's why we're going to talk about self-care today. I also want to thank, where is Mark sitting? Where are the Mancinis again? Oh, okay. So, Mark, every time he introduces us, he has a way of expanding and inflating our accomplishments and our titles. So, if we had done one more workshop today, Mark would have gotten up here and said, and Mike, is the supreme galactic overlord of all of Duke University, and in fact, the entire state of North Carolina. And so we just love the way, you know, keep doing that, Mark. We, yeah, that's great. So we really appreciate it. Let's talk about, oh good, my, my phaser works. Let's talk about what we're gonna talk about today. Um, we have spent the entire weekend scaring you to death about things, mental disorders you might have, or if you didn't think you had any, probably by now you do, and Will can talk you into it, and you're like, oh my goodness, there's so many bad things that we could be suffering from, and we've talked about why and what causes them. Now we waited till the last day to talk about what to do about all this, and what kind of preventative medicine you have to do to make sure stuff like that doesn't happen to you. So this first, yeah, first slide kind of sums it up. Um, stand up, take a walk, get a cab, go to the airport, and never return. <laughs> We're about to do that, so, you know, thank you. That's this morning's talk. Just do that and you'll be fine. Five simple instructions. Or here's another one that I favor. I use this one routinely. Um, place to bang your head, place it on a firm surface, follow the directions on the kit, and repeat that step if necessary, and if you're unconscious, then cease stress reduction activity. You don't need it anymore, okay? So either of these are good ways to handle stress and, and pressure, and I highly commend them, as long as you have a hard surface to knock your head against. Um, let's talk about something we touched on a little bit before, but not, didn't go into a whole lot of detail, is stress. Everything is related to stress. If you, does anyone in here not experience stress? Ra you liar. <laughs> Go away. We don't want to talk to you anymore. No. <laughs> Everyone does. Everyone. This is a stressful world. I don't care where you live, where you go, what you do, you're under stress. Um, here's the thing. Stress isn't just an emotional thing. It's a physical thing. It, it affects your physical functioning, which we're going to talk about a little bit today. So this is what happens. Remember yesterday I talked about the fight or flight response. It all starts in your brain and your brain perceives something threatening or dangerous. And your um, pituitary gland tells your adrenal glands to start s releasing adrenaline and cortisol. These are stress hormones that get your body revved up and ready to go to either fight this threat threatening thing or run away from it or freeze in terror. The, here's the deal though, back in caveman days, you know, your stresses were pretty obvious and discreet. You know, you're coming out of the cave and there's a saber-toothed tiger and this whole thing happens and then you take your spear and you slaughter the tiger and then the cortisol that's running these stress hormones that are running through your system dissipate because you've done the physical activity of taking on this saber-toothed tiger. No longer in the 21st century do we have saber-toothed tigers. Our stresses now are things like your boss, 
you know, you, you go into work and your boss says, you have to have this done in the next two minutes and, you know, read these 83 treatises on this and, you know, or you have someone that's treating you unfairly at work or something like that. Unfortunately, you can no longer take the spear and run the person through <laughs> and dissipate. I've tried it. They don't like it. HR will be all over you. So what do you do? You're stuck there in this fight or flight response. And if you don't do something with it, it's going to eat you alive. Stress hormones are dangerous to um, cardiac tissue. That's why you have people who, who drop dead of heart attacks from stress. Because this stress, these stress hormones going through all the time, wearing down your cardiac muscle until you just can't take it anymore. However, what you probably don't know, you're like, yeah, I know I'm under stress. If you think you're not under stress, there's two different kinds. Um, the kind of stress you're used to that we don't need to talk about is distress, right? It's when, you know, the boss comes down on you or you have to make a deadline or something like that. That's distress. But there's like happy stress too, or should I say stress from happy things. We call that eustress. That's like it's Christmas and all the family is coming to our house for Christmas. Yay! I can't wait to see them and to cook for seven days to get ready for it and to clean all the rooms and to deal with uncle you know who is going to pick a fight with so and so and yay! I can't wait. You know, or you go on a vacation, and you have to worry about getting things lined up at work before you leave, and then packing everything and getting checked in, and then TSA, and the, you know. These are, these are happy things, but they still stress you out, right? Um, any interaction you have with your children is usually going to be this kind of, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Most kids, you know, up to a certain age group, um, it's like that. So, if you don't do something about it, now, I, I put on this slide, some stress is good. You know, if, if you didn't have stress, a sense of stress, you wouldn't do your best on your job, right? So a little bit of stress presses you to improve your performance. It's really, if you watch the Olympics, what amazes me is how can these like 14-year-old gymnasts bear the stress of having 87 billion people watching them and they have to go out there, and I, I'm, I'm in awe of them. I don't know how they do it. Um, but certain amount of stress gets you prepared. It's a prompt for you to do your best and get prepared. But there's a law of diminishing returns, right? A little bit of stress is good. When it goes over the top, now you're on the decline, and it's like, uh-oh, now the stress is overwhelming me into a point of paralysis, and I can't get anything done. So you don't want to do that. Um, but if you don't deal with distress, the bad kind of stress, or even you stress. If it becomes chronic, then it goes to burnout, which we talked about yesterday. And then if you don't do anything about that, it could contribute to mental illness. And if you don't do anything about that, you might die and or go insane one after the other. I'm just kidding about that. That's a little, OK, don't be. I was just kidding. Um, the point is, if you don't do anything about chronic stress, it escalates and becomes something really bad. Burnout is the physical and mental price you pay for stress that's uncontrolled. It becomes burnout, unrelenting stress. And the definition we used um, a couple of nights ago is the loss of enthusiasm, cynicism, and a low sense of personal accomplishment. If your stress goes under con uncontrolled and you develop burnout, we deal, Mark has said that I train young physicians. We deal with this all the time. And like I said on Friday night, these young physicians coming in to be trained, to be family practitioners, they don't want to admit that they're stressed out. They don't want to admit that they're insecure. They don't want to admit that they're overwhelmed with all the things they have to do, including taking care of patients, taking their boards, going on different rotations. But they don't want to look. They don't want to talk about it. So one thing I encourage them to do is you've got to open up about this stuff and you have to admit that you're under stress. I guarantee you that the person sitting next to you today can relate to whatever stress you're under now. No man or no woman is an island. No man or no woman is stress-free. So we have to have a, a, a culture, we'll talk about this in a minute, a, a more open culture about what's bearing on me and who can I share this with. Here's the problem, though. If you've been a disciple for like eight minutes, 
you've been indoctrinated, especially us old people who've been around the church for decades, we were indoctrinated to believe that exhaustion, the more exhausted you are, the more righteous you are. If you haven't worked yourself into a mass of nerves, into a puddle of nerves, you haven't done the most you could for God. You haven't been self-sacrificial. That's what self-sacrifice means, to wear yourself out like this. And then you will earn God's approval when you finally drop dead of a heart attack. Um, I challenge you to continue thinking that way because you'll always keep us in business. <laughs> we'll, so go ahead. We'll, we'll always have a job as long as you keep thinking that way. But it's not that way. Exhaustion does not equal righteousness. But how did we come up with this idea in the first place? We misuse certain scriptures like this one, Philippians 2. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. You know, you read that and you're like, oh, well, we're supposed to be exhausted. That's what Paul did. That's what we're supposed to do. Isn't that biblical? But I think what people do is they read poured out as wear out. Does that make sense? Instead of pouring your, your um, mental and emotional energy into something, it means wearing yourself out physically. And that's like the definition of your service to God. You do this and you have no fun. That means we're being self-sacrificing. Here's another one we like to use. Um, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Some people think that deny yourself means mistreat yourself. Some people think that deny yourself means neglect yourself. I'm reasonably sure Jesus didn't mean that. Once again, we read it like, oh, okay, deny yourself until you're this neurotic mess. Um, I don't think God means it that way. How do I know? Because of other scriptures, like this one, Matthew 11. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, that's you, I will give you rest. Jesus says this isn't supposed to be a burden. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus said it. I didn't invent it or make it up, and I didn't read it in a textbook. These are Jesus' words. This, what we're doing, is supposed to be easy, not stressful. I mean, not severely stressful. It's supposed to be a joy and not a burden. And there are other scriptures about taking care of ourselves. 1 Corinthians 6 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God, you're not your own. You were bought at a price, so glorify God in your body. That means take care of your body. The way I look at it is your, your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. Your body is a rental car. It's the rental car that your soul rides in until your race is done and you're ready to go to heaven. That, it does paint a picture and having said that, I wish my rental car was more like a, a Porsche, like a 911 <laughs> or something like that instead of, but what, you know, what, we, we go to the rent-a-car desk and we get what we get. But we're supposed to take care of it until we're done using it. But this is what people do. If, and <laughs> believe me, Mary and I, by every definition, clinical and otherwise, are elderly. So this, this, that car on the right, yeah, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's pretty much us right there. If, but do you think it's right to mistreat something God has given you? If you get a really opportunity to buy a really cool car and you say, oh, this was a blessing from God, do you then run it ragged and don't take care of its mechanical needs? No. If your car breaks down, it can't serve you. A lot of us take better care of our cars than we take care of ourselves. We look at the, don't you, 
mostly dudes, look at the maintenance schedule in the back of the owner's manual. Up, 25,000 miles, got to do the this and this and this. I do. I'm neurotic about that. But we don't look at our medical records and say, oh, it's time for the annual physical, or when was the last time I had my blood drawn, or when did I last go to my primary care physician? You see the inequity there. You see the difference there. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to get personal and talk about how to take care of yourself through things like sleep, hobbies, exercise, diet, and the importance of friendship. Now, let me just tell you up front, nothing you hear for the rest of our time standing on this stage is going to be a revelation. Nothing is going to make you go, wow, I never heard that, or golly, I never thought of it that way. We're not that smart. What you're going to hear is going to make you roll your eyes and say, well, I already know that. My question to you is, why aren't you doing it then? <laughs> so we're going to talk about some stuff, and I'm going to say, you need to move this stuff. I deal with this with my young physicians. I say, you know, what are you doing for self-care or what are you doing for hobbies or exercise? And they say, when I get a chance. I'm too busy right now, when I get a chance. They see it as an indulgence to take care of themselves, as an indulgence. When I get a free moment, I will be consumed with guilt for doing something fun instead of helping someone in my family group or whatever, but I'll, I'll do it. All I want you to do with these non-revelatory things we're going to talk about is move them from the when I get a chance pile to the I must do these things pile. Life or death, I'm going to prioritize these things so that stress doesn't kill me. Does that make sense? So first thing we're going to talk about, something that eludes most of us, rest, rest and sleep. Do you feel rested right now? You don't look rested, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at a few faces here. Might have wanted to get that extra hour or two. But God commands it. Exodus 20, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter. Our kids are fine with that part. Um, neither you nor your son or your daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. God rested. The creator and king and sovereign over in the entire universe rested. Now you think, you know, yeah, you construct a galaxy or two. That's probably tiring. But I guarantee you he didn't need it. Did God need this rest? No. He's setting an example to us. I think it's more likely he did this as a model for us to follow, right? So maybe he knew, since he invented us, he knew that we would have this propensity to work ourselves to death. And if he didn't command rest, we wouldn't do it, and we'd put ourselves in an early grave. He wanted to make sure we gave ourselves a time for restoration, right? He knew that we, you know, and it's not because we're noble people like God knew, oh, these people are going to work themselves to death because they're so good and they're so good-hearted. He knows we're neurotic people. We're going to work ourselves to death because we're afraid of what happens if we don't. Someone's going to fall through the cracks in our family group, or I'm going to go broke, or I'm going to lose my job. That's why I work myself to death. Doesn't matter what your motive is, you still can't work yourself to death. But as disciples, have we not trained ourselves to feel guilty if we're not constantly doing something in the service of our ministry? or our families, or other people, all of which should be done, but there are other ways to do it than I think most of us do. So that's why God mandated rest in the Old Testament. He ordered the Sabbath. It was a requirement in Old Testament times, and you better obey it or you're in trouble. But even before that, if you think about it, he mandated rest in our bodies. He gave us the need for sleep. You ever wonder about that? Like, I suppose God could have made us as never sleeping. That's why he made Target and Walmart, so we could go shopping at all. I don't know. He could have made it so we didn't have to sleep, but he did. 
he made it so we would have to get rest and, and force us to be quiet for a certain number of, of hours every day. Um, easier said than done, though, right? So let's talk about sleep. Um, we're not really good at sleep, just in case you, you were wondering. Um, between 35 and 50% of adults get less than adequate sleep, which the general, according to the Sleep Institute, is around seven hours for a, an adult and more for younger people. Some of you look at that and you're like, seven hours of sleep? I haven't slept for seven hours since I was like a fetus. You, you know, I mean, that's how... That's how poorly we get rest. Sleeplessness, if you don't get good sleep, is associated with increased risk of diabetes and hypertension. Because so much happens in your body while you're sleeping, including regulation of appetite hormones, ghrelin and leptin. Those are reset and regulated. So if you, if you don't get enough sleep, you're at higher risk for obesity and hypertension. So you have to get so many restorative things happen while you're asleep. Um, inadequate sleep, the risk of stroke is four times greater. Four times greater risk of having a stroke if you don't sleep well. Increased risk of death by accident. You know why that happens? Because your body forces you to sleep whether you want to or not. If you're not getting enough sleep, you have these micro sleeps. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Where your body will make you fall asleep no matter what you're doing for a few seconds at a time. And you have these micro sleeps, and then you wake up and you're like, this used to happen to me when I was a young intern. I had to drive once a week from Athens, Georgia to Rome, Georgia, which is about a four hour, three or four hour drive. And I had to be there in time to start work at like eight, work all day, and then head home through Atlanta traffic to get back to Athens. I would be exhausted because I was young and stupid and I wasn't taking care of myself anyway. So on the way home, I remember this distinctly on 285 going with the Atlanta bypass. What woke me up is my hands falling off the steering wheel and hitting my lap. And it was one of those, I'm good, I'm good. Okay, no, I'm good. And that happened several times. It's only by the grace of God that I'm still here to tell this story. God was looking at me then saying, you know, we got to be careful. You got to talk about this later. So you'll have these micro sleeps. Hope that it doesn't happen when you're operating heavy machinery or driving or doing something else important. So your body's going to make you sleep whether you want to or not if you don't get enough rest. Um, insufficient sleep is related to depression and increased cortisol levels. Those stress hormones don't they dissipate while you're asleep, and if, you, if you're awake, they won't. And lastly, you might even lose brain cells. There, I read this study where they kept these mice, they took a bunch of mice and they kept them awake. How they did that, I'm not like, like when they're drifting off, did they go in, hey, get up, you know, these little mice or something, or, you know, did they give them cigarettes? I don't, I don't know. I would have liked to have seen it. But anyway, they, they kept these mice from falling asleep, and they started losing cells in the locus ceruleus, which is in your brain stem. It's a part of your brain that helps you regulate mood and emotion. So no wonder you get grouchy and miserable when you don't get enough sleep. Um, it's also a, a part of your brain that helps you deal with panic. So you really have to get enough sleep. Once again, easier said than done. I know that, Mike. I'm a chronic insomniac. I haven't slept for 102 years. Here's some hints. Sleep hygiene has been shown to improve the chances that you get a good night's sleep. You all think that sleep is just sleep, and it's not an art form. You don't have to figure out how to do it, but you really do. It's important that we develop good sleep hygiene habits. Nap. Um, napping's good. My young physicians have to do night call every so often where they're on for three nights in a row. And we talk to them about napping, getting 30 minutes. Here's the deal, though. You can't nap for more than about 30 minutes. I know we all want to take that nap when we get a chance, and three hours later, you get up. Um, but what happens when you do that? Have you ever done that? And you get up after, like, a three-hour nap after, like, eating turkey on Thanksgiving? And... The rest of the day, you're like brain fog, mega brain fog, and you're like, where am I? What's going on? 
That's called sleep inertia. That's something that happens when you take a long nap and you get up and it disrupts your circadian rhythm. It disrupts your sleep-wake cycle. So nap, but only for 30 minutes. If you say, I don't have a chance to nap during the day, you can, I don't know, maybe you don't, but you can always find a way. I've become a master at shutting my door, leaving a light on so people think I'm working, <laughs> propping my feet up on the desk and leaning back in that chair, and I'm out for a good 20 minutes. I mean, it can be done. You can find a way to do it. So napping is a good thing. Now, here's something Mary and I have deep convictions about, but don't always follow our own advice. Okay, screens, including your tablet, your television, your phone, don't listen to what they say. Well, I've got blue light filter. <laughs> it doesn't matter physiologically. Light is light. It stimulates the optic tectum, which tells your brain you should be awake. So it don't matter if you have blue screen filter or orange screen filter or whatever. No screens before bed for an hour. This is really hard to reinforce with kids. But it's going to keep you awake. Um, well, what am I going to do for my hour before bed? I don't know. You might want to get one of those um, leafy things. Uh, books. Oh, yeah. They're called books. <laughs> might want to try one of those. They're old-fashioned. You don't have to plug them in. You don't have to pay a, you know, a monthly service. Read a book until you get drowsy, and then you'll fall asleep. Um, here's another one. Look, I get it. Um, the problem with... so it, Sometimes you're tempted to self-medicate your sleep problem with a little shot of something. If you're in the great state of Texas, I'm pretty sure it's some kind of tequila, like Herradura or something like that. Oh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. But the problem with alcohol is it disrupts the sleep cycle. You'll fall asleep quickly, but you won't get the stages of sleep that you're supposed to get. So in the long run, it's, it's not good for you. It also increases metabolism and contributes to... Um, it may, making your body think it should be awake. Also, here's another one we have deep convictions about. If you're, if, what usually happens when you're sleepless? You're lying in bed like this, right? And your mind is running, and you look at the clock, and you think, oh no, in four hours I gotta be up and go to work. I, I gotta get to sleep. Mm, mm, and you try really hard to sleep. And then, but you're still like this, and then two hours later, you look at the clock, oh no, now it's only two hours, and I gotta get to sleep. <clears throat> Doesn't work that way. If you're not asleep, the, the worst thing you can do is lie in bed. Why? Because then you train yourself to associate the bed with sleeplessness and not sleep, like Pavlov's dogs, right? You're just gonna, so then when you go to bed at night, you're gonna go, oh, there's the room of torture again. There's the, there's the torture rack. I have to lie down in it and make hope, hope against hope that I will fall asleep tonight. Don't do that because you'll associate the whole bedroom and the bed with sleeplessness. If you're not asleep, get up, go into another room, put on a low wattage light bulb so you don't have a lot of stimulation, and read until you feel drowsy. Then try it again. The most important thing is don't worry. Um, your body is an amazing thing, and like I said, it will restore your sleep at some point, maybe not the way you like it. But I've told my patients, you don't die from lack of sleep. I mean, unless someone is purposefully keeping you up, you won't die from lack of sleep. If, if you're having trouble sleeping tonight, it, maybe it won't be so bad tomorrow. Worrying about it doesn't make it any better. But don't stay in bed if you're not sleeping. Get up, do something low low light, low visual stimulation, then when you're drowsy, try it again. Pleasant sleep environment. Um, believe it or not, research has found that 60 to 67 degrees is the best ambient temperature for sleep. <laughs> this, now, if you adhere to this, we might have to have another marriage retreat <laughs> because this is going to cause some debate, I imagine. I'm just saying, don't shoot the messenger. That temperature convinces your body that you're, you're about to hibernate. So it's more conducive to sleep. So 60 to 67 degrees. 
decrease all ambient stimulation. That means make the noise go away. Now, someone said uh, white noise machine. That's fine. The only, my worries about white noise machines is you get addicted to it. Like, some of our grandkids are, have been raised on noise machines, and I'm like, well, what are they going to do when they, I don't know, join the army or something? They're like, and they, so I don't know. In our opinion, the best thing to do is decrease all ambient noise, so we wear foam earplugs and stuff like that. Also, eye shades, anything to limit ambient light. Put blackout curtains on your windows, whatever you need. And then, comfortable yet inspiring bedding. My personal favorites are the Star Trek series with a blueprint of the Enterprise. I can cuddle up to that and just snug. It just makes me feel so secure and comfortable. And then I dream of being on the bridge of the Enterprise and I fall right to sleep. So I recommend that to anyone. Um, if none of this works out, yes, there are pharmacological aids to sleep. You just have to be careful, and they should only be taken short term. Um, melatonin is a popular, right? But people think that because melatonin is a natural thing, you don't need a prescription, that it's entirely safe, and you know, you, you have to be careful. Use as directed. The other thing is more melatonin doesn't mean more. Melatonin's best to restore the sleep-wake cycle, like if you've been traveling and you've crossed some time zone. Melatonin is a good thing. Most people think that so three milligrams, three to five milligrams of mel melatonin is good. Some people think if I take more of it, it'll make me sleep better. You're just going to pee it out. So three to five milligrams and stop there. If that doesn't work, there are some other things, Lunesta, Ambien, and um, benzodiazepines like Xanax. But oh my goodness, you have to use them so sparingly. They're only intended to be short term to get you back on track. And I've done that with some of our patients. You know, we're just going to do this as a short term to restore that normal sleep-wake cycle, but not forever and not take them for a long time. Um, I don't know if any of you, you know, people on Lunesta and Ambien, things like that, have some really weird, it targets a different benzodiazepine receptor, so they have some weird dreams and activities, and people will wake up the next morning and their spouse will say, you know, you built a battleship in the basement <laughs> all night, and they're like, oh, I, don't, I don't remember any of that. So you have to be careful. This is another thing you can't do. Um, sleeping in bed all day on the weekend to make up for it has been shown that it further disrupts the sleep cycle and messes with the appetite controlling hormones we were talking about. And insulin sensitivity drops by 27% in weekend sleepers. So all you're going to gain is, is some weight if you're not careful. So sleeping in on the weekends isn't the ultimate solution. So that's the world of sleep and rest. And I hope you don't lose any sleep over it. Um, Mary's going to talk about another sensitive issue. All right. I'm going to ask for a little mercy this morning because Michael's already told you we spent the last two days eating our way through Texas. And I have to get up here and talk about eating a healthy diet now. So, you know, I think I ate every mammal that God made, maybe not elephant, but they may have snuck it in there somewhere. I don't know. So we all know what this means. Like Michael said, this is not, you're not going to hear anything new here. You, everybody knows this. We all know, all right? More fruits and vegetables, whole foods, eating food as close to the way God made it as you can less processed food, uh, lower your sugar and salt. We all know what's healthy, what a healthy diet looks like these days. You can't avoid it, all right? What you may not know, we think about it only as, as how it impacts our physical health, you know, to, how, how good I feel, or I'm going to avoid a heart attack, or I'm going to look great at the beach this summer, you know. But what you may not know is it has a huge impact on your mood and your brain health. Um, there is a whole realm of mental health now known as nutritional psychiatry. And I've taken several workshops on it. It's very complex, very interesting. But it talks about how what we put in our body, what we eat and drink, significantly affects our mood and how our brain works, you know, our risk of dementia, um, how alert we are. You know, if you're drinking 
five caffeinated drinks a day, you're going to feel anxious. You just are. I mean, that's just an effect of what you're putting in your body. Um, so, you know, sometimes as I'm doing these workshops and reading about this stuff, you, it can get very overwhelming, right? Have you guys ever looked at that and gone, oh, my gosh, what a, you know. Here's what I would encourage you to do is to change the one thing you know right now that is not good for you. The one thing you know right now, change that. Um, the, the graphic we have up, first of all, I think this is, is this like the traditional Texas breakfast or? <laughs> I don't know, you know, I don't know. But just in our family, we, we had to, we, the rest of us had to have a French fry intervention with a certain Dr. Shapiro that will remain nameless and say, we know you love the French fries, but you probably shouldn't have it at every meal, all right? So, so just change the one thing that you know you need to change. More, more fruits and vegetables is probably the biggest, biggest takeaway for all of us. Um, then let's talk about the next biggie, exercise. Um, again, we all know how important exercise is for our physical health. But I want to give you some, some of the research on how it affects our mental health. There, and there's tons of it, tons of it, and more and more coming out every single day. There is one study that says if you burn 350 calories three times a week in some type of sweat-producing exercise, it can be as effective in treating mild to moderate depression as prescription antidepressants. That's big. That is huge. Yeah. Um, you know, when I would see people, when people came to my office and I was treating them for depression or anxiety, their first homework assignment was, you figure out how to do some kind of exercise three to four times a week, something that you will stick with, because it is so effective in helping us. It's the biggest stress reducer that we, that we have. Uh, for us older people, there's another study that's not on here um, I think it came out of Sweden, where they took two groups of men who had the genetic markers for dementia, and they divided them. And one group they put on a regular exercise program, and the other group just kept doing what they were doing. And the men that went on the regular exercise program, their risk of developing dementia, and they already had the factor for it, was four times less than the group that didn't exercise. So we're talking about life and death issues when we're talking about exercise. Like Michael said, it has to go off of the if I have time list to the it is a priority list. You know, Michael and I exercise five days out of the week probably, do some form of exercise five days out of the week. So figure out what you can do sustainably. You know, I love to walk. I love to take my walks. Most of my good prayer times are at, we have a little park next to us, thank goodness, that I can do, I can do four miles in an hour, you know, and I do two miles with Jesus, and then I do two miles dealing with whatever I've got in my brain that I've got to deal with, you know. <laughs> That's the way that works, and I love it. It's wonderful. I'm out in nature. I, I meet people sometimes. It's wonderful. Figure out what what you can sustainably do and put that on the absolute to-do list. Um, there's some research that says complicated physical activity, and that's things like playing soccer or um, tennis, pickleball is a big one these days. Um, I'm an old dancer, so I love dancing. That's what I love, you know. Um, anything where you have to think while you're exercising, um, it reverses the effects of stress at a cellular level, you know. So you get even more benefits out of those things. And the, the good thing about those things is while you're doing them, you don't really think I'm exercising. You know, it's not like getting on the elliptical. You know, you're like, I'm dancing. I'm having a great time. Um, we all know exercise produces endorphins, which are natural painkillers. Um, exercise increases the growth factors in the brain and may ward off dementia. Um, and in this growth factors thing, th this is another thing I do with I run an ADHD clinic, so I'm constantly seeing kids who are having trouble in school for whatever reason. And again, the first thing I tell the parents is, are they getting exercise, regular exercise, preferably outdoor? 
you know, unplug them from the eye, whatever they're plugged into, and get them outside and get them exercising because they're going to do better in school, you know. So it, this is not just for, for grown-ups. This is for everybody. Exercise is super important. Couple more statements about exercise before we leave that one. I do want to reiterate that uh, Mary and I have a 70-mile commute to work. Um, she goes two days a week. I go five days a week, 70 miles. So we get up really early in the morning to have a quiet time. We get on the road, drive 70 minutes, um, work all day, drive 70 minutes back. And it is a rare day that we don't drag our sorry butts to exercise. But is it be, you know, because you think this comes easy? <laughs> I mean, right? <laughs> Am I right? So, but really, it's not because we're awesome and uh, have deep conviction about exercise. It's because we're terrified of what's going to happen if we don't. We do this. We drag our sorry butts to exercise every day because we're scared because we're so old. You know, we're much closer to 70 than we are to 60. So if we don't do this, what's going to happen? Or, you know, the house we live in, fortunately, we live in a townhouse that has a very narrow footprint, but it's got a lot of stairs. 31 stairs from our garage to our upper floor. I've told my wife several times, these stairs are either going to kill us or keep us alive. <laughs> uh, and I'm banking on that during COVID, when we couldn't go to a gym or whatever, we, we did stadiums. We'd run like six sets of five up and down the flight of stairs and, you know, then try to increase our speed or whatever. So you make do. Um, the rule of thumb is when you say, what's a moderate amount of exercise, stress, sweat producing exercise? I tell my patients, if you can have a conversation while doing whatever you're doing, you're probably not exercising enough. Because I've got lots of patients who can't, their exercise is going to the mailbox and coming back. That is fine. That's fine. That's a great place to start if you're making yourself where you just can't have a conversation. That means we're right about where we want you to be for a short period of time. The important things are to set smart goals. Don't go into this, don't leave here today and say, ah, oh, that's it. I'm gonna recommit to exercise and I'm gonna look like Dwayne the Rock Johnson, which is not good for the women to a goal. Anyway, <laughs> I'm gonna do that by Christmas. You can't do that. You have to t take little tiny steps and come up with a smart, sustainable, measurable goal. I'm going to be able to do, you know, by Christmas, I'll be able to go from 10 push-ups to 20 push-ups or from zero push-ups to one push-up, something like that. The other thing is being consistent. Um, I tell my young physicians, if you make this, if you just put it in your daily schedule. So I encourage them on Sundays, sit down and go over their week schedule because their schedules change a lot depending on what rotation they're on. And I say, you're going to pick a, a time each day from this hour to this hour and come, you know what, or high water, I'm exercising. I don't care what anyone, you know, I'm turning off my pager. I'm just going to do this from this hour to this hour. If you do that enough times, it builds up habit strength, and then you don't think about it. It's no longer this big effort. It's just something you do every day. One more thing. It doesn't have to involve a gym membership. Um, there's some research that shows that as soon as you begin exercising, your body, your cells start producing mitochondria, which are the energy producing things in your cells. So it doesn't have to be a gym membership. Just make your life a little more physically complicated. For example, you know, when you go to Walmart, take the park in the farthest away parking space and, and walk. <laughs> That was either a cheer for Walmart or the exercise. I'm not sure which one, but whatever. Um, I have a colleague at work. I work in a three-story uh, building. Actually, there's four stories. Um, he never takes the elevator. So if he has to go from the first floor to the second floor for something, he walks all the way up to the fourth floor and then walks down to the second floor. So I'm like, I'm all for that. That's, uh, that's great. Do something like that, unless you work in the Sears Tower or something, and it's, you know. Um, another thing he does, which I don't advise you to do, he's got one of those spit bits, you know, or whatever, whatever. And he sets it, he's got to do these, he's super 
compulsive of about 8,000 steps a day. Or 10,000, yeah, maybe it was 10,000. The problem is he's made that the goal in itself, which is not the good thing. The goal is to be healthy, not to make this 10,000 steps or something bad's gonna happen. So he'll be like, you know, if he's running a code and there's a patient in cardiac arrest and his Fitbit goes off, he's like, you're gonna have to excuse me. I'm gonna, I'm, I'll be right back. Or sometimes we'll be having a conversation and he says, excuse me, and right in the middle of the conversation, he'll start, you know, so you either walk with him or you don't get done what you need to get done. So you don't have to get to that level of obsessiveness, but he's got the right idea. Some level of exercise every day. It doesn't have to be a gym. Now to my favorite topic um, of all, hobbies. Now you're going to have to, I picked this graphic because it's got my two favorite hobbies, motorcycling and martial arts, which I did for 30, I'm a 30-something year veteran of martial arts. The dude in the bottom blue one laying, I'm not exactly sure what he's doing. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm reasonably sure you don't want to be doing that. Um, but someone, when we did this lecture before, someone said, no, he's looking at the stars through a, and I'm like, whatever, okay. Don't know why you're lying down in a relaxed position to look at the stars, whatever. Um, also the top left, the top right, who, plays cricket. Raise your hand. Anyone? One, one, maybe two people. Okay, look, I'll be honest with the rest of you. I, we did a um, workshop in South Africa with the Rentons. Some of you might know the Rentons. It just so happens that they were having a cricket tournament. Now, cricket tournaments aren't like tournaments we have. They go on for weeks, months, years, it seems. I mean, they're these long, protracted, you know. So I sat down with Justin. I said, all right, you're going to teach me everything about cricket, and I'm gonna understand this game by the time I leave. By the time I left, I knew less, understood less. They're like throwing the ball backwards and bouncing it when you pitch it, and no one wears gloves, and you're like, you know, I'm, so I would advise you, unless you're really committed, don't study cricket. It'll just make you more <laughs> neurotic and anxious. Um, as to the other things, there are many, the reason I'm, enthusiastic about hobbies is because many hobbies are spiritually restorative, spiritually restorative. I'm not talking about playing Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto or <laughs> not video games. Those are not spiritually restorative, nor are they relaxing. I'm talking about active hobbies that you have to think while you're doing them. Like the elliptical is fine. That's when I watch my Star Trek episodes. That's fine. But exercises that, uh, in hobbies that involve the mind as well as the body are best. They put you in the moment. There's a concept in psychology called mindfulness. You hear it a lot. Mindfulness is when you stop worrying about the past. It's, it's already done, can't do anything about it. You don't worry about the future. It's not here yet, can't do anything about it. I'm doing something that engages me 100% in the moment. That's why I like, for example, riding a motorcycle. Yes, I know you can get killed and lose a limb and your head gets smashed. I got it, I understand. Everyone tells me that all the time. However, what I'm saying is while I'm riding, I am in the moment. I, it's a very physical thing, you know, you feel the, you, 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 physically lean into a curve and you smell the smells and you see things and and if you're not in the moment you're, you're dead <laughs> you know <laughs> if you lose concentration for a second you're going to get picked off so it's a very to me a very mindful activity um, we did ballroom dancing for years I, the, I had to exercise my mind at every second to keep from stepping on her like it was very complicated um, Yoga, of course, has the most evidence-based support as the best mindfulness, physical and mental. There's tons of research on yoga and how awesome it is physically and mentally. I just don't look good in those tights, so I can't do it. Um, the other thing is I'm the one, when you get to the meditation part, and there's someone in the room going, <laughs> that's, that's usually me. So you pick a mindfulness 
activity. Um, I believe God gives us the opportunity to do hobbies to get our minds off of whatever is troubling us, at least for a little bit of time, um, and draw closer to him. Here's the problem. We tend to think of these things as indulgences, right? And when I asked my young physicians when they're first starting the program, I said, what do you like to do that has nothing to do with medicine? Nine times out of 10, someone says, I used to. I used to do artwork. I used to knit. I used to cook. I used to play the cello. But I don't do that anymore. I had to stop during medical school, and there's no way I can do it now. Yes, you can, and you'd better do it to get your mind off of the day-to-day -day stress. Um, so it's a, it should be a life or death. And once again, don't go home and say, well, Dr. Shapiro just gave me permission to play 13 hours of golf three times a week, <laughs> and there's nothing you can do about it. No, be sensible about the mindfulness activities you choose, that they're not too demanding and take too much time away from your family, but they need to be done. They need to be, go to the, I must do this. Um, yes, you're welcome. <laughs> you know, the other thing is, you know, some of them are kind of back doors into ministry. Rarely do I go out of the house without wearing a, you know, I ride Triumph motorcycles, so I always have a Triumph shirt of some kind, and, you know, that's when you get people going, oh, I used to ride a Triumph. Oh, what was it? And, you know, it's a little backdoor to ministry. So it doesn't seem to happen as much when I wear Star Trek stuff. For some reason, <laughs> people tend to stay away from me. I'm not <laughs> sure about that. Um, another interesting thing you might want to try is a device detox trip. Have you ever heard of that? A device detox trip is when you go away and you take no electronics with you. None. And you're like, how, how can you do that? So let me tell you a quick story. Our daughter-in-law comes from a family in Los Angeles, who some of you know, the Kramers. Their family has two houses on a beach in this distant peninsula in Mexico. This, these two houses are so remote and so far away from anything, they don't have walls. They have furniture, they have appliances, but there are no walls. It's just a bit, they're giant thatched huts. Now, yes, there's walls around the shower. That's, you know, we gotta do that. But they're, they're wallless. No one disturbs it because there's no one around. They pay someone from some distant land to come in periodically and clean things up and, and take care of it. So what they do is you fly into Cabo or someplace like that, and they have a car there that they leave there for just such an occasion. So they decided to take us once um, with my son and daughter-in-law and just before they had kids. So you get there and you fly in and you get in this car and there's a, first you stop at the supermercado, which for those of you who are not Spanish speakers, that means supermarket. <laughs> and you load up with all the provisions you're gonna need for the week and you drive, 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 and it's like three or four hours to get onto this distant peninsula, which is in some kind of protected area. So there's not even air commerce. There are no airplanes. It is out in the middle of nowhere. Now we get out of the car. My poor wife is the, one of the hardest working people I know, and the only time she can give herself permission not to work is when she can't, when there's no work to be done. So she finds it hard to rest at home because there's always something that needs to be cleaned or cooked or put away. So we, come, we get out of the car at this place and she busts into tears. To her, this is a dream. There's nothing to do, nothing to do. <laughs> there's hammocks and, you know, my son gets out of the car and he's like, I'm gonna see how many, well, forgive me for telling on him, but I'm gonna see how many empty Tecate beer cans I can stack up in a pyramid without them falling. <laughs> That was his goal for the week. Everyone is just having this great time. So one night, we're all around the table, and uh, Henry Kramer says, we're going to do good news, what is it, good news, bad news, or something like, what is the high point, high point of the day? What's the high point of your time on this vacation? And everyone's, I love the restfulness and the beach and the ocean. And they get to Mary, and Mary says, I'm not having, a, I don't have a high point because my husband can't relax. I was a wreck. There was no, like, I'm like, what, what do you do? There's no, you know, 
like, I'm, it's very flat there at the beach, so I was like making a mound of stand to stand on to see if I could get reception. I'm like, what do you do? You can't communicate with humans. What, what do I do? You know, and everyone's sleeping like a baby with the surf rolling in and the sound, and I'm like, what's that? What, what do I do? I mean, I was going through some kind of withdrawal with no, you know, I didn't realize how dependent on my phone and my computer. So I'm miserable. My daughter-in-law, God bless her, says, you know what's wrong with you? You've forgotten how to have fun. And she said, um, and I thought about it, and I thought, you know, she's right. My goal when I was younger was this. This is what I wanted to do for a living, sit on the beach and do nothing. That was my occupational goal when I was 18. What happened to that naive kid? So they talked me into, you know, I found a kayak and some skin diving gear, and I started loosening up, and I finally had fun. You ever see the movie Hook? So it's a movie about Peter Pan, who forgets how to be Peter Pan, and then he figures it out. So at one point, my daughter-in-law comes up to me, and she goes, there you are, Peter. <laughs> and I went, okay, I get it. I needed to have a device detox trip. It's not for the faint-hearted, but you ought to try it sometime. Now, speaking of hobbies, um, you can, evidently, <laughs> some people find it relaxing to um, face dangerous, large, wild animals and shoot them. That's both relaxing and mindful. Um, so, if this is what you like to do, and then put them in your home. <laughs> so Barry is like, she's a saint. I don't know how, you know, how do you clean the thing and dust it? How'd you get in there in the first place? But whatever. John has learned how to make hunting savage beasts into a relaxing, mindful activity. God bless him. And God bless Barry for being willing to have that in her home. Um, one more important thing about wellness. James 5.16, confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. Proverbs 17.17, 17, a friend loves at all time and a brother is born for adversity. This is not a point about you have to confess your sins. This is a point about how important friendship is when it comes to mental health and well-being. You have got to retain friendships out of your workplace that are close um, for the sake of your own mental health. We read this study once. Um, it was by the Gallup organization. They wanted to get to the root causes of homelessness. So they um, did lots of surveys of homeless people, and they said, what, why do you think what resulted in you being homeless? And you would think it would be socioeconomic factors or where you live geographically or were you raised in an impoverished home or whatever. They said it's because of lack of friendships is why they ended up homeless. So um, they felt unloved. They felt like they were not valued. So the Gallup organization did some subsequent research that was interesting, and there, here's some things they found. Do you know if your best friend eats healthy, you're five times more likely to eat healthy yourself. Why that is, I don't know. For dudes, I think it's because we're so competitive. You know, so like if I go to lunch and, and Mark says, you know, I'll have a quinoa salad, then I'm like, oh, oh yeah, well, I'm gonna have a bowl of sticks and rocks. <laughs> yeah, so there. I don't know, I don't know why that is. But you're five times more likely to eat healthy if you surround yourself with friends that eat healthy. Friendship, believe it or not, five times more important than sex, excluding the newlyweds. Okay, newlyweds, don't, don't worry about it. But that's how important friendship is. Those who have no real friends at work have only a one in 12 chance of feeling engaged in the job, but if you have a best friend at work, you're seven times more likely to feel engaged. So um, another quick story, when we were in private practice, we had the same office manager for 20, eight of our 30 years of being in practice. She was a very efficient but crotchety woman. I hope she's not listening online or something. She was great. 
we depended on her so much. There was stuff she kept off my plate, but she, and she was good with patients when they needed to be told what to do. Mostly, she didn't love being around them so much, so she was in her back office taking care of business, and we were all fine. It was Mary and me, and there she was in the back doing her work. Um, when she retired, so she didn't need a lot of friendship. She worked best without distraction. When she retired, we hired this lovely young girl who was just starting out. And right about the same time, the psychology office across the hall hired a new young active office manager as well. And our offices were linked um, by a hallway. So I'm expecting our new young office manager to act like our old one. And all of a sudden, I started seeing the girl from the across the hall office appearing in my office and they're chatting. And I'm like, what's going on here? You, you two, you know, I was like, you're taking time away from my office manager that she could be using to do my slave work instead of having a good time. But then I thought about it and I'm like, now wait a minute. These are normal young people. They need social stimulation. She needs a best friend at work. So I started encouraging it. I started, I called it um, virtual water cooler time because I was too cheap to actually buy a water cooler, but I encouraged them to have time together, you know, and so in the morning I'd come in and I'd say to her, if, you know, is, has your little playmate been here yet? Because if not, we need to call her over. So for your own sake, find a best friend. Find a best friend in the congregation. Someone that you can, that knows you backwards and forwards, the good and the bad. Don't be embarrassed to confess sin so that you can get help because I guarantee you they've dealt with stuff too. So that's the importance of friendship, which is also a godly principle um, that you should follow. Lastly, if any of this makes any sense to you, this is something I have my young physicians do. If any of this is like, yeah, I need to get better at that. I talk to them about a personal wellness plan, making a personal wellness plan. It can be very simple. You, you make a four square on a sheet of paper and divide it into four squares and you do compartments. Health, personal achievement, altruism, and awareness. Health is how you feel about your diet, exercise, your physical condition. Am I going to the doctor enough and so forth. Personal achievement is am I engaging in activities, not only just ministry activities, but other activities that are making me feel fulfilled or promoting my intellectual growth. Mary, in preparation for retirement, is, has, is taking pottery classes. So she's making little pottery things. I don't know. She came home the first day after the first one. I said, how did it go? And she said, I'm afraid I'm going to have to be in a special education pottery class. <laughs> but now she's making these beautiful pieces of pottery. Altruism is what kind of impact you're having on the lives of other people. Um, Oh, forget where it says it's why you went into medicine. This is what I usually show my young physicians. And awareness is how you're doing in terms of forming your personal identity, establishing your own values, keeping up with my convictions in the Bible. So you make these four squares and you rate yourself from one to five, If you're with five being the best. If you have no problems with this, I'm doing great, you can leave it at a five. If, it, if things are under five, don't say, I'm going to take on all four squares at once. Pick one thing. This is the one thing I'm going to improve, my physical health maybe, my exercise, my diet. In six months, I'm going to do this again. If I've moved up a couple of steps, great. I might even switch to a different square and work on that for six months. But this is a way you can rate yourself and keep up with your own progress. So that is everything we wanted to share with you about self-care. Not that it was an exhaustive list. There's plenty more stuff you can do for yourself, but um, we appreciate, again, the attention, the time you've devoted to us, and the affection. And I believe we're going to take communion? Or? Okay. Yeah, I will. Thank you. Um, thank you. If you... In the, in the Triangle Church where we worship, at this point, the person at the mic says, if you don't have one of our communion cups, raise your hand and an usher will bring you one. So if you don't have a communion cup, do that and someone will get one to you. But let's, let's pray.
the offering. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for everything, for your word that tells us how to live. If we're willing to devote the time and um, intellectual energy to pouring over it and being more Christ-like, all the answers are in your word, and we're so grateful for that. We're so grateful for the family that's surrounding us right now in this room, for the brothers and sisters we've made and have known for years to the ones we've just met and will be family for the rest of our lives. We're so grateful for the fellowship. We're grateful for, um, most of all, Jesus, who sets the tone, who sets the model for what we're supposed to be like. And uh, right now, we want to appreciate and be grateful for what he did by dying for us so that we can talk to you like this and have a personal relationship with you. And pre please honor our prayer as we take this bread and this juice. In Christ's name, amen.